gives me real pleasure to welcome you all here today to this Peffin seminar. Uh, Sean is here as a visiting fellow at Exeter for more than 10 years, from 2005 to 2018. He was general counsel and director of the legal department at the IMF, uh, advising management and the board too, I imagine, on, on uh, uh, all legal aspects of the fund's operations, uh, which went across advisory, uh, regulatory, and its lending functions. Uh, we came in to across each other when I was doing work on the reform of the financial system and came and talked at the fund, and when you were thinking about the set of issues that the fund faced in this area, we also collided soon afterwards in thinking about regulatory aspects of financial crisis management and the question of uh, the extent to which debt write-downs were possible and how they could be managed. And those two things just showed me some aspects of how wide the activities that Sean uh, was doing in the fund. And it's great pleasure to have had him here as a visitor for the year. Um, let me now pass over to you. Thanks very much for being with us, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Um, I must say that you know when I was looking uh, at the title that I had chosen for my remarks, which is crisis prevention and resolution, I actually realized that it didn't quite convey the degree of humility that is needed. Um, <laughs> trying to prevent uh, and resolving financial crisis would have been more appropriate because the fact is that the international community, particularly the IMF, where I worked for many years, has really struggled with this issue for many years. Um, you know, regarding prevention, my experience is that crises are look completely predictable and, and inevitable in retrospect. Um, and then also resolving them is, my experience, very complicated because of diversity. You know, one naturally wants, when a crisis is emerging, one naturally wants to use the knowledge, the insights that one gained from the previous crisis, but you find yourself being the general fighting the last war, because every crisis has different characteristics. Uh, and I know that there are physicists who try to discern patterns from what otherwise we would see as random and chaotic events. I, I'm not going to try to do that. I'm not a physicist. I'm actually not even an economist. I'm just a lawyer. What I will do is share some observations that I have based on my experience at the fund for, for 28 years. I joined in 1990, just as the Latin American debt crisis was in its final stage of resolution. But then we had a series of crises in the 1990s, which include the Asian financial crisis. Um, we had the great default in Argentina. We then had a long period, which was called the great moderation, which as we know was really a buildup of excessive liquidity that resulted in the great financial crisis of 2008 and then of course the eurozone crisis so a lot to mull over um just a note on terminology so when i talk about crisis resolution my sense is it's it's not just crisis containment uh, once a crisis is in full swing the immediate prop priority is to contain it to stop the run, to stop the panic. And I certainly don't want to underestimate the importance of doing that. But once the panic recedes, it's really critical to address the underlying forces, the underlying causes of the crisis. Otherwise, there's obviously a risk of recurrence. I mean, you know, while the crisis that triggered in 1992 the Latin American debt crisis was contained relatively quickly. It wasn't really resolved until you had comprehensive debt reduction um, in the late 80s and early 90s. And appropriate for this group here, you know, there is a question as to whether or not the Eurozone crisis has really been resolved. It's been contained, but are the underlying forces gave rise to the Eurozone crisis, have they been resolved? 
The second thing is that when we talk about international financial crisis, we're really talking about debt. Um, not that debt in and of itself is, is a bad thing. I mean, for policymakers in emerging markets, it makes eminent sense to access the savings in wealthier countries in order to finance development projects in emerging markets. And while foreign direct investment is more stable, there are often concerns, legitimate concerns, in countries about the loss of local control over key industries. So the problem is not debt. The problem is over-indebtedness. And when there is too much of a good thing. And many of the crises that we've experienced over the last 40 years are what are generally referred to as balance of payments crises, caused by over-indebtedness. And at least for emerging markets, countries experience these balance of payments crises when the amount of foreign exchange they need to pay for imports and goods and services, they generally cannot do that using their own currency, is greater than the amount of foreign currency that they can generate through their own exports of goods and services. To fill this gap, they borrow. And generally, and generally, foreign creditors are more than happy to basically oblige. Given the fact that the lending rate is lower than that, what they would normally be able to get, in, uh, or higher than in their own countries. Um, and they basically protect themselves by lending in foreign currency, their own currency, and also with a floating interest rate to protect themselves against interest rate changes. The risk arises, and I mean, I think this is normal and I think it's beneficial. The risk arises when essentially the, the indebtedness increases and persists, <coughs> and particularly where the payment capacity of the country begins to, to decrease. And this can happen for a number of reasons. It, one is that the domestic policy mix reduces the competitiveness of the country, and that can be because the borrowing is accompanied by loose monetary policies, fiscal stimulation. Often, it is associated with a fixed exchange rate, which becomes overvalued. That's good for repaying the debt, it helps in terms of the repayment of the debt, but all of this results in the country becoming less and less competitive because of that overvalued exchange rate combined with the inflation. And foreign creditors begin to recognize this. It can be exacerbated also by adverse external environment. In the Latin American debt crisis, a big factor was the rise in interest rates and also recession in the advanced economies that resulted in a less demand for exports. For whatever the reasons, foreign creditors begin to get nervous and they don't cut off access immediately. They lend at higher rates and more importantly, they lend at shorter maturities. And this is where the dangerous dynamic kicks in. Because at this point, the country is borrowing not to fund domestic investment, but simply to repay its debt. We're in a refinancing game. And therefore, its ability to repay its debt depends on market confidence. And we have seen that market confidence is a very fickle beast. Um, when it turns negative, either because of a adverse development, a political event, you, remember, you may remember the Brazil crisis was caused by the election of Lula, uh, it can result in a sudden stop in financing. And at that point, it brings the country to the brink of default. And this is particularly the case because these maturities become increasingly short-term, or as some people say, the maturities become runnable because they can run very quickly. And at this stage, it's not just that foreign creditors are refusing to finance. It's also because residents begin to realize that a crisis is about to occur and they want to get their money out. So there's a, a huge outflow 
of capital. Now, this is that's a really stylized version, and I'm sure, you know, a number of the people in this room are saying, well, and also there are a number of crises that have not fit that fit that pattern. In particular, there has been a number of debt crises where the over-indebtedness has actually not been with the sovereign itself, but with the bank, banking sector, the corporate sector, and even in the household sector. This is the case, for example, in the Asian financial crisis with the banking and the corporate sector, and in the Eurozone crisis, you know, even household debt. Um, so, and what's, what, what is very difficult about those crises is that the balance sheet problems in one sector exacerbate the balance sheet in another sector. For example, to the extent to which the corporate sector is going down, it brings down the banks. The banks need to be recapitalized, and that basically translates the problem into the sovereign itself. Um, so it's, that's one of the reasons why the great financial crisis was so problematic. One crisis that doesn't fit this is the, the crisis in the United States, which was not a balance of payments crisis. Um, it was a crisis which, interestingly, and the fund got this terribly wrong, like many others, which is that there were huge global imbalances. The US had a major current account deficit. But the crisis erupted not because of a loss of confidence in the dollar, which everybody thought would happen but rather because of overextended leverage in the banking system in the United States. As I think Adam Tu said, the IMF predicted the wrong crisis. Um, so, but I think that, and that's partly because of the, the status of the US dollar as the reserve currency. People were willing to hold US dollars even in the face of a, of a crisis. So one of the aspects that I just want to spend a minute on on inter international financial crises that's so critical and important is the issue of contagion. And I think it's important to realize that there are several different types of contagion. Um, one form of contagion is, is a form of sort of financial gravity, which is that when you have um, debt that is owed by a country to another country and the creditors are actually banks. And the insolvency of a sovereign can result in the, the insolvency of the banking system in the creditor country because of the um, reduction in value. This is what made the Latin American debt crisis a global crisis because essentially uh, at one point um, the, the uh, debt owed by um, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela to the nine largest banks in the United States, represented 120% of their capital. Um, we also saw that, of course, during the Eurozone crisis, when many European banks held Greek debt. So that's one form of contagion. Another form of contagion is what we refer to as portfolio reallocation. Institutional investors lose a significant amount of money in one country, and in, especially when they have been um, lending on margin, and they basically need to cut losses by pulling back in other markets. And we've seen that. But perhaps the most important form of contagion is one that is not really financial, but is driven by fear. Um, and it is more psychological. And what's really interesting is we've seen how when a crisis hits a country, investors may be simply unsure as to whether or not the underlying problem in that country is shared by others. And we saw that a lot during the Asian financial crisis. And this shift from a risk on to a risk off, this binary shift uh, amongst investors. And what is interesting is how narratives begin to take hold. You may remember that during the, before the Asian financial crisis, the economies such as Thailand and Korea were celebrated as the Asian tigers. Superb growth model. The Asian financial crisis erupts, and everybody believed that they had financial systems that were rotten to the core. <coughs> Suddenly, the narrative shifted. Uh, and changing narratives also apply 
not just to countries, but to markets and instruments. Securitization of debt. You may remember that before the great financial crisis in 2008, the fact that mortgage debt had been securitized and sold to a broad range of financial institutions were judged by many to be good because it reduced risk by spreading it. Um, well, the crisis changed the narrative completely and very quickly. Securitization led to lower lending standards. If you were going to sell it, you didn't really care about whether or not it was going to be repaid. Also, the complexity of the securitization process created uncertainty in terms of value, which resulted in liquidity being cut off in the middle of the crisis. And finally, if you held it on your trading book, you had to mark to market, which actually meant a transition from liquidity to insolvency. So securitization, everybody thought, was a wonderful thing until the crisis. So how to respond to crises when they occur? Um, well, when a crisis occurs, the immediate objective, when there's a run, is to stop the run. And one way to stop the run is to stop it by force. If the debt is owed by the government, the government simply stops paying. If the debt is owned by a company or a bank, you, the government can impose exchange controls to stop them from paying. And this is a pretty muscular approach. And actually, there's a view out there held by many, including in academia, particularly in academia, that actually this is the preferable approach because to the extent that the crisis was caused by imprudent lending, it is entirely appropriate that these imprudent lenders be forced to bear the risk of this imprudence through default. And if you fail to do that, if you bail them out, you would create moral hazard. In other words, you, if they're shielded from these losses, they're just going to repeat this pattern of excessive lending, and you're going to have future crises. So it's a good story, but I have reservations. I think in some cases, which I'll point out, it's actually appropriate for there to be defaults. But I think, at least in the fund, there is a sense, based on experience, that it should be the last, not the first resort. Why? Well, to the extent to which the run is being driven by panic and fear, a default will only spread the panic and fear. Uh, and also, the direct financial contagion, both within the country and elsewhere, can be severe, particularly where the banks holding the debt where the banks in the country that hold the debt. It can result in the insolvency of the banking system. So it will only exacerbate the circumstances for the government because the government's going to have to recapitalize the banks. So the point is, is that there is a legitimate desire to punish imprudent lenders. The problem is, is that there's a tremendous amount of collateral damage. Okay. So balancing this concern of moral hazard on the one hand, and the pain inflicted by a crisis on the other, it's not easy. This is a critical problem that the fund has faced every time it has a crisis, how to balance those concerns. And in some respects, public policy is always about choosing between bad options. Uh, my own view is that moral hazard is a problem, and one should address it, but not in the middle of a crisis. The time to address moral hazard is when you're designing the system, which I'll talk about in a second. I think in the middle of the crisis, the priority should be to stop the panic. And this is generally done to the extent you can by building confidence that the country is going to be able to repay its debt. Um, and that's the whole objective of having an IMF supported program, is to catalyze that confidence. And normally there's two elements that are traditionally used. The first is financing, sometimes a large amount of financing. And the second is adjustment. Um, and the idea is that they're supposed to be self-supporting. 
Often the financing that is needed has to be large. In, in fact, sometimes extremely large. As Tim Geithner pointed out, I think, pretty well in his book, there is a contradiction because if it is sufficiently large to impress the market, it may not actually need to be used. But if it's doled out in small increments in a hesitating way, it will be used. Um, but the point is, is that even if you have large financing, you need to have adjustment because at the end of the day, the market wants to be convinced that the country is going to have it be introducing the policies that will enable it to be repaid in the long term. The financing may be able to help pay out maturities that are coming due in a very short period of time, but the longer term investors, they need to see that basically policies are being implemented that are credible. Uh, one thing that we have learned from crises is that the adjustment that can be reasonably expected of a country is limited. While some austerity is needed, too much will be counterproductive and not credible to the market. The market will see what is credible and what is not credible. And they want to see that the country is introducing reforms that will generate the tax revenue to get repaid. And sometimes excessive austerity destroys growth. Growth, once it stalls, will result in lower tax revenues. So austerity can become counterproductive. There's been a whole discussion of multipliers, um, which I'm sure many in this room can speak about more authoritatively than I can. The reality is, is that the, in many countries, the only way you get sustainable growth, because at the end of the day, you need to have growth. Countries can only repay their debt if they're growing out of their debt, is if they improve their competitiveness. And one of the particular challenges that was confronted when designing adjustments in the Eurozone, particularly in Greece, is that a currency devaluation, which is an instrument that has often been relied upon by emerging markets to achieve competitiveness is not available because they don't have an independent exchange rate policy. Another challenge that was faced in the Eurozone crisis was that the problem was not just weaknesses in the economies of the countries, but also flaws in the design of the Eurozone architecture. Indeed, in some respects, the Eurozone was a crisis of incomplete integration. And, you know, one of the consequences, for example, you know, the Eurozone created a single financial market. We saw after, for example, Greece entered the Eurozone that it was able to borrow at rates that were not that different from Germany. But they were, the markets were regulated on a financial basis. And when things were going well, there was so much lending that actually the financial supervisors it, it outstripped the capacity of the financial supervisors to regulate it. And when things went badly, it outstripped the capacity of the national resolution authorities to basically finance it and actually resolve it. And as a result of that, the insolvency was shifted to the balance sheet of the governments. So considerable progress has been made. I think there are people here who can speak on this more authoritatively than I can with the uh, single supervisory mechanism, with the single resolution mechanism. There are issues about whether or not they're adequately funded. We don't have a deposit insurance yet. There's also this issue as to whether or not, which I think has been a subject of PEFM's uh, seminars last term about the need to have a greater sort of central fiscal capacity which is, uh, I think the fund is, continues to push for. I think Adrian Chiesley gave a talk on this. So there's a whole set of issues about whether or not there is you know, an adequate architecture in the Eurozone at this stage. One last point on crisis resolution. I noted that in most cases, what you want to do is avoid default by providing large amounts of financing to support adjustment. There are circumstances, however, where it's just simply not possible to follow that strategy because the over-indebtedness is so significant that no matter how much financing you get from the fund, because the fund, remember, is not providing grants, the fund is also a lender, so you're just building up debt. 
No matter how much financing the fund provides, no matter how much adjustment, the country will not be able to repay this debt. The debt to GDP ratio will continue to rise. This is what we call when the debt becomes unsustainable. And in those circumstances, it is imperative that you engage in the debt restructuring process earlier rather than later. A delay helps no one. You end up putting the economy through greater distortions, greater sort of um, you know, calisthenics, and, it, and also for creditors, especially when what happens is the short-term creditors get paid off, they're replaced by fund credit, which is senior, and it just results in the remaining commercial creditors having to take a greater loss when the debt restructuring actually occurs. So when the debt restructuring becomes inevitable, it's in everybody's interest to do it earlier rather than later. One of the problems in the Eurozone crisis was the delay in the debt restructuring in the case of Greece. The, result, the, the, reason give, the reason why it was delayed was a fear of contagion, but given the fact that the debt was already unsustainable, I think that was a mistake. It should have been done in 2010. The delay did not stop contagion. Markets continued to basically tank all over Europe, notwithstanding that. Uh, because essentially there continued to be uncertainty as to whether or not debt, uh, Greece was going to be able to repay its debt. The fund has acknowledged the fact that that delay was costly, both for creditors and for Greece, um, and has revised its lending framework to try to avoid that from happening uh, again. Um, one of the challenges about debt restructuring is that it's become more complicated. In the 1980s, the creditors were a small group of banks that were subject to the regulatory suasion of governments. They had long-term interests in the countries that made them want to basically perform, play a constructive role in the debt restructuring process. Now, as a result of disintermediation, essentially the creditors are bondholders. They are not subject to the regulatory suasion, at least not to the same extent. They have no long-term interest in the countries and they will maximize value, and if that means holding out, they will hold out. If that means suing aggressively, they will sue. So the debt restructuring process has become far more complicated, which is another reason why there tends to be a delay. The fund and others have tried to strengthen the legal framework to address these collective action problems. We've made some progress, but I think the jury is still out as to whether or not they're adequate. I want to just conclude, David, if I may, with a few points on crisis prevention. You know, when the, when some of you may remember, when the 2008 crisis er erupted, uh, the international communi community convened under the auspices of the G20. And there was a desire to both stop the run, but also begin to plan for the new architecture that would prevent this crisis from ever occurring again. And some of the crisis prevention ideas were extraordinarily ambitious. You may remember that it was called Bretton Woods II, and we were going to have a single supranational financial regulator that would have jurisdiction over all financial institutions. That did not happen. And I think many of us were not surprised it did not happen because, quite frankly, over the last 75 to 80 years, there's been a decline in the degree of sovereignty which countries are willing to basically surrender to institutions like the IMF, notwithstanding the fact that countries have become more interdependent in the interim. So we, do not, we did not have the type of formal surrender of sovereignty the way we did in the fixed exchange rate system in 1945. What, we, we, what was created instead was essentially a, a crisis resolution, a crisis prevention framework built on what I refer to as soft law. Countries agree to harmonize their financial regulatory systems and then Basically, once they've agreed on what the best practices is, whether it's new capital requirements or the extension of the regulatory uh, perimeter, is to then basically have institutions like the fund 
monitor the extent to which they, countries are adhering to these standards. It's a concept that was created uh, in, during the, after the Asian financial crisis and it's really continued with the great financial crisis, for example, cross-border banking resolution. The original, some had ideas that we would have a single bank resolution authority that would basically resolve all global banks. And of course, what we have instead is harmonized bank resolution frameworks that have been made more flexible so they can cooperate with each other. But there's no formal uh, legal obligation. Uh, I think this is important because it will allow for the orderly wind down of cross-border financial institutions, and that is a critical step to address the moral hazard problem. It hasn't been tested yet. One question is whether or not in the next financial crisis we're actually going to use this framework or whether or not we're going to just do bailouts again. Uh, there's also reform that's been done to the IMF surveillance so that the IMF looks more critically not only at macroeconomic issues but also financial regulatory issues. Uh, and the fund was heavily criticized for failing to basically understand the macro financial linkages in 2008. So there's been a lot much, much more focus on that. FSAPs, for example, have become obligatory for countries that have systemically important financial systems. I should point out that even when the fund gets it right, which it didn't in 2008, there's a problem because countries won't necessarily listen to the fund's advice. As long as they're continuing to get financing from the market, no matter what the fund says, there will be a limited appetite to do reforms that might be difficult. One improvement has been transparency and the fact that now Article 4 reports of the fund are made public does create some degree of market pressure. It also, to the extent to which crises are created by uncertainty, the dissemination of information helps in that respect. Um, I would point out, and this is actually a point that I made when I spoke here last time on corruption, which is that no matter how much, no matter how much uh, progress the fund makes, no matter how much progress the official sector makes on regulatory reform, you will not have a system that's sufficiently safe until you actually begin to change behavior in the financial services industry. Um, you know, as you know, the, the crisis revealed serious ethics problems in the financial services industry. At a panel that I moderated that included the Archbishop of Canterbury back in 2010, he pointed out correctly that, you know, ethics is not just about avoiding fraud. It's also about avoiding recklessness when your actions can have a profound impact on people who are less powerful. And what you need is not a culture of compliance, which is why you have to be careful about overworking the rules because you're just going to get circumvention. You need to begin to develop a culture of, of values and how do you get people to do the right thing even though no one's watching. So that's a real challenge. Um, Obviously, it's not something the fund can do, uh, but it's something which I think is being discussed intensively. How do you basically raise ethical standards in the financial services industry? And, you know, there's an obvious point to this. Um, I don't know if any of you went to the Oxford Union event at, the, at Michaelmas term where Steve Bannon came, and he strode in to the Oxford Union in his raincoat, stand, stood in the middle of the room, and didn't talk about immigration. He talked about, he started off talking about the financial crisis. And he basically said that it was this crisis that was the key to understanding Trump's victory, because it was this crisis that generated the popular backlash and the narrative that the crisis had been caused by the elite, but the elite had been shielded by the con from the consequences. So the stakes are high not only financially, but also politically. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>